Welcome back to the program. This is still Good Morning Kenya. Time for our second conversation this Tuesday morning. And as we talk about the youths being the leaders of tomorrow, what about today? What happens today? And what opportunities are there available for the youths when it comes to leadership and governance? That is our conversation this morning, our focus being on perspective of youth when it comes to leadership and governance. My guests are on set. They'll be helping us dissect this conversation all together and helping us understand just where exactly the youth lie when it comes to leadership, governance, and politics all together. I'm joined by Dr. Sylvester Obongo to my extreme right. He is the Director of Performance and Service Delivery Transformation at the Public Service Commission. Right next to him is Jim India, the Program Manager at Emerging Leaders Foundation Africa. And lastly, I'm joined by Andrew Levi. He is the Global Senior Manager at Emerging Leaders, uh, Emerging Public Leaders USA. Gentlemen, Karibu Sana to the program. Thank you. Let Thank me you. start with you, Dr. Tari. This is actually different entities coming together to form the Public Service Emerging Leaders Fellowship. Tell us about this um, formation, what it's all about, the aim, why it was formed, and what it's set to do. Uh, uh, thank you very much. What is emerging is that any organization worth its salt must deliberately develop its leadership. Mm -hmm. So this is a very deliberate move for the Public Service Commission to ensure that the public service has a pipeline of leaders. We are doing that in collaboration with private sector uh, partners because the public sector does not exist in isolation. Mm -hmm. And uh, this program has been implemented in the Liberia with a level of success and Ghana. But we have contextualized it to the Kenyan situation, okay. where we are actually uh, uh, selecting from among young public servants who have served for one year and less to take them through a systematic and a deliberate leadership program that will ensure that they are ingrained in values of public service, that the are leaders who are citizen focused, that they are leaders who are who are citizen oriented and service delivery focused. Mm -hmm. So that for me, any organization what it's sold for continuity must deliberately develop its leadership. All right. You'll mm. be chatting out 50 youths today because that is when events is going to be, uh, be taking place today. What are you seeing in mind in, the term, in terms of the kind of impact these young leaders are going to have in the society, Jim? Thank you. Um, so at Emerging Leaders Foundation, for the last 10 years, we have been in the business of um, training, supporting, and particularly mentoring young leaders from across the country um, in different sectors. And until very recently, we started this partnership with our partners from Emerging Public Leaders in the US and the Public Service Commission here. Our interest was how do we then support young people who are within the public space? Because we have a huge number. The public service uh, in Kenya has, for the last um, about 10 years, has been really bringing in a lot of young people to internship programs and retaining quite a number of them. Mm. But over time, our interest is in the event that we have a huge chunk of the civil service who are actually going to exit the civil service, are we preparing young people to actually take up leadership at that particular time? Mm -hmm. And so this uh, investment is to prepare, position strategically young people who have gone through a rigorous meritocratic process of selection and, they, and who have been identified as potential next leaders of the public service who will then influence the public service. Because we have realized that our issue has never been about capacity. Our issue has never been, all the issues that we talk about the civil service have been grounded on values. Mm -hmm. And that is our interest, raising values-based leaders at the end of the day. And so the 50 of them are going to be trained for a whole year they will be trained on the rigor of the public uh, of the public sector they will be um, again pa uh, paired with the mentors who will walk with them the journey those who have gone ahead of them those who will tell them things that otherwise they will not be taught in class mm -hmm. those who will show them the ropes and 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 uh, you know the what I would call the secrets of being within the public service yeah. that will prepare them when their time does come mm -hmm. and so that for us is what we see as a potential influence of these young people that in the next 20 years we will not have a leadership gap 
in the next 10 years we'll have young people ready, equipped to take the mantle from those who have gone ahead of them and they will be grounded on values. Mm -hmm. I mean, Levi, James says that we'll not have a leadership gap in the next you know, number of years, he's mentioned it's a question of values. What are you bringing to the table as emerging public leaders to this entire public service uh, emerging leaders fellowship? Okay, <clears throat> that's a fantastic question, Doreen. And first of all, good morning, Doreen, and good morning to all Kenyans who are watching, particularly the youth. So as has been said, um, you know, if you want to enjoy the shade, uh, you don't start to plant a tree today. You plant a tree before and then you enjoy the, sh the shade when the time comes. So our view as emerging public leaders is we were based in the U.S. and we saw that there's a gap in Africa. And this particular gap is that the public service is such a critical component of development. And we know that the youth demographic in Africa is extremely high. And so we saw an intersection of opportunity there. There's a saying that, uh, that comes from the public service, whether young people have a call and a will to serve. And how we come in as emerging public leaders is that we marry the call and the will to serve with an opportunity to serve. And so this opportunity is for 50 fellows across uh, the whole breadth of Kenya, the 47 counties. And this particular uh, fellowship has about 50% of them are female, 50% mm. of them are male. We also have persons with disability represented. So we it's see all that inclusive? Every single uh, youth member has a part to play in the course of development. Okay. We started in Liberia under the office of, the pre of President Ellen Johnson Sirleaf uh, by our founder Elizabeth Williams in the US. We moved to Ghana where they needed to attract youth and that was under the office of the Vice President. And here we have the privilege of working with the Public Service Commission uh, and various other partners including the Emerging Leaders Foundation uh, to create this program. And we think that the youth, uh, these 50 who will be coming into this program, have the chance to dynamically impact uh, policy shaping and service delivery. Mm -hmm. I mean, Dr. Ari, from what Levi is saying, clearly it's a holistic um, kind of program because he's talked about the persons with disability, the men, uh, women. Clearly there's no uh, gender bias. So how do you go about sourcing these young people? Yeah, thank you very much. Yeah, apart from what you have said, mm -hmm. we have actually chosen one from every county. Okay. Of those who qualified. So we want to ensure that we carry everybody along. The process was competitive. We, because we are developing public sector leaders, we wanted those people who have joined the public service. Mm -hmm. So what did we do? We sent out call, application calls last November. We said they must have served for one year or less in the public service. And we also gave them an opportunity to give us a 500 word essay on what they see their publics, their, 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 their role and future in the public service. Mm -hmm. uh, believe you me, we only needed 50 but we had 5,000 applicants. And the most interesting thing is that 3,000 applicants were from outside the public service. So we are realizing that there is need really for leadership development, just not in the public service from outside. Mm -hmm. Out of the 5,000 applicants, 3,000 were from outside the public service. So those ones were disqualified based on that because we are focusing on the public service. 1,200 applicants did not do the essay, so we knocked them out. 733 did the essays, so we had 740, 733 potential candidates. From the 733, we therefore went through the essays regulars, regu reg rigorously and other qualifying criteria we came up with a short list of 164. From the 164 we shortlisted, we took them through the interviews, we ranked them. And then in our selection criteria, we therefore chose the leading from each county. But what he will not tell you is that by the time we are doing the final tally on Friday, mm -hmm. in fact, we have got 27 ladies and 24 men. So we are taking the affirmative action beyond the minimum threshold. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well said. Yeah. Let's stick on that 3,000 a bit that were not in public service and yeah. had applied. Yeah. I mean, what are you doing as a commission? Because obviously not everyone will be in public service and I might want to be part of this program. So. Is there anything that is being done or yeah. just it's a must, you have to really be in public service? 
as a public service commission, my constitutional mandate remits me the public service commission. I cannot recruit for Barclays Bank. I cannot recruit for Standard Chartered. Yeah. I cannot recruit for any organization. Mm -hmm. You see, so, 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 so really. But beyond that, maybe this is coming up. Beyond that, after this launch, I'm actually, and we're actually developing a concept that will see us collaborate with the private sector mm -hmm. and post youth through our internship program to the private sector. Okay. We've also been running an internship program now for the fa last four years, and we are in our fourth cohort. Mm -hmm. We take one, uh, 3,000 fresh graduates who have not joined the public service, and we post them to the public service institutions. Mm -hmm. But we've realized that the need is so high mm -hmm. that when we have only 3,000 positions, last year we had 46,000 applicants. That's why we are realizing that we have already reached out. I've already reached out to, to the core. I've already reached out to FKE. I've already reached, we're reaching out to KMA so that we can form a collaboration outside this fellowship program that will see us actually recruit interns and post to the private sector institutions where they can grow. Mm -hmm. so well said, I like, uh -huh. You want so, to get into that? Yeah, absolutely. So, Dorian, I think this is a fantastic problem that we have on our hands. Mm. That young people want to be involved in public service and in leadership and to be on the decision making table. Yes. Uh, for us as emerging public leaders, as I mentioned, whilst we're based globally, we are partnering with many organizations and many governments. And what we see is that there's an opportunity to work with the Public Service Commission as we're doing. But uh, going forward, there's an opportunity to also engage with state corporations, mm -hmm. with county governments, and also with organizations that are not part of government but frequently interface with government. Mm -hmm. So we see that as also another aspect or an avenue for us to pursue uh, going forward. And I think these young people uh, should be happy because uh, in due course, uh, at least they know that their concerns are on the table and we actually want them to, be, to make a difference. It should not be lost in us also that it's individuals such as Tom Boyer who only at the age of 29 designed the US airlift to go and make, uh, to go and send at least 81 students to go study in the US. One of those students became a Nobel laureate, mm -hmm. uh, Wangari Mathai. So what we can say is that the young people deserve to be here and it's our job and the job of many other stakeholders to create these opportunities as Emerging Leaders Foundation has also been doing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and I think what you're saying about the 3,000, um, and we thought that was an interesting statistic, yeah. that a majority of those who are looking for opportunities are outside. Of course, you know government can only employ a small number of the population yes. and we know the reality is one of our unemployment statistics but there's clearly um, this is good that young people are looking for opportunities to grow young people are looking for opportunities to develop themselves and they're not sitting at home and saying we want opportunity that you know we want to be in leadership spaces or we want to be at decision making table mm -hmm. they are actually looking for those opportunities and the question now would be for people like in our spaces in the in the in the NGO space and in the private sector how do we create more of those opportunities and over the last 10 years we have actually been creating those opportunities by running leadership programs with um, now is the first time that we're getting to do this with government, but we've been opening up spaces for young people who are willing. And for the last 10 years, we've trained over 10,000 young leaders mm -hmm. spread across different spaces, mm -hmm. spread across the breadth of this country, um, and supporting them to how do they hold their leaders accountable at the county level? How do they start their own organizations that respond to solutions uh, at, at their community level? How do they go back to their communities? Because you have a lot of young people who come to cities and towns, and they become successful. And forget about where they're coming from yeah. and our leadership uh, trainings and and, 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 and and trainings have been focused on supporting them to then realize that they have a duty back to their communities to start look at uh, challenges within those communities start organizations start initiatives that then respond to that and over the last uh, 10 years we have seen that young people are capable if given the opportunity mm -hmm. and if with the right mentorship of creating solutions within their communities that then transform a whole mm -hmm. um, the whole community you mentioned trainings. Talk to us a bit about that. What really happens in terms of trainings? Because again, you also talked about mentorship, networking, yeah. Yeah. churning out leaders that are very ethical. So really what exactly happens there? So for this particular program, uh, what is going to happen is this week, uh, we 
have the 50 plus one. Um, we added um, an extra fellow. We needed 50, but we added one more fellow um, just to sweeten things up. Mm -hmm. And they will be going through their orientation. And so the entire week, they will be trained on, um, you know, what is the public service? Um, and we have facilitators, uh, facilitators who are coming in. Um, and our facilitators are actually practitioners. They are people who have been in the public service. You're not okay. bringing in facilitators who come to theorize about the public service and who come to say what the public service should be. We have people who have been at the very top of public service facilitating sessions with these fellows. And remember that they're already in the public service. So we're not telling them anything new, but we're talking to them about their day-to-day -day, um, training. So our trainings are very practical in nature. They are facilitated in nature. And so a lot of the solutions are coming from the fellows. We also, it's also very practical because we have what is called, uh, we'll have a root cause analysis challenge where we present them with a challenge and they come up with solutions in real time and present it before a panel and say, this is a public policy challenge. For instance, uh, right now there is the border border, which is a public policy issue. Yeah. It is it, beyond anything, it is a public policy <coughs> issue. And so we can present them with such a solution, uh, such a challenge and ask them, as a public servant, what would be your solution to such a challenge? Mm -hmm. And they would present back and we would award the best, uh, the best uh, solutions that come our way. And so to that extent, we help them create a lot of community among themselves. We help them to talk among themselves. We connect them with those who are already in the public service, um, like Dr. Sylvester and others like him who have availed their time, who have availed their um, experience to us and to these fellows to actually get to um, interact with them. And throughout this, uh, throughout this, this week, these fellows will be then um, exposed to what the program is about. After that, we'll take a break. Mm -hmm. And during that break, they'll be going back to their station but we will have a, uh, a performance management uh, criteria where we will be asking them, monitoring their performance, monitoring how they're doing at their workstations. We are pairing up, the mentors that we are pairing them up with are mentors within the public service who are working with them on a daily basis. And so these mentors are reporting back to us on the progress of the fellow. The fellow is reporting to us on their progress. And so what you're realizing is it's not a lecture. We are not calling them to a workshop for one week and then sending them back to their, to, to their workstations. We are actually interacting with them the entire time that they are working for the next one year that will be with them until graduation. So it's more practical. Yes. What is the vision of PCELF, Dr. I mean, this is the first lot or the first cohort that you're churning out. How does it look like in the future? Yeah, it, it, for me, it looks very bright. One thing that maybe we have never realized is mm -hmm. that we are not just offering an employment opportunity. We are offering a platform to operate at a global level. Mm -hmm. The public service offers a global platform. Uh, and, and, and for me, that is what excites me. Mm -hmm. the, 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 the curriculum we have put in place takes the fellows through a systematic development stage. It takes them through the public sector at times is a very complex organization to understand. It has got different ministries. It deals with various issues. If you are in the Ministry of Finance, you are dealing with the finances. If you are in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, you are dealing with the outside countries. Mm -hmm. If you are in internal security, you are dealing with within the country. So a government and all those sectors must come together. Mm -hmm. For me, this opportunity is not just a mere employment opportunity. Mm -hmm. So I'm not looking at it as you are only offering 50, but I'm saying that I'm offering 50 an exposure to expand. I'm offering 50 to see things differently, to see things at a country level to understand how are we as a country developing where are we coming from during when i went to first year there were only 3150 graduates in kenya there were only two universities that has changed but is the competition any less no there was it was as competitive as it is now what defines you from an everyday person is your ability to understand your environment and ride on it. Mm -hmm. The environment is extremely competitive. We are training and exposing these people to understand where is the government going and where are we leveraging. At the very best, the government is a facilitator of the environment.
We want them to understand that in their positions, we expect them to be innovative, mm -hmm. come up with extremely innovative solutions to, 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 to all the issues that come up. We want them to think not only outside the box, but without the box, because that society has changed with globalization, with, with, with ICT spreading across, yeah. we are operating at a completely different environment. Mm -hmm. But the biggest challenge is that the citizen is enlightened more than ever before. So we want them to be able to interact effectively with the citizens. We are preparing them for the public service of the future. Yeah. We are, not, we are not in a position where we could say, maybe at independence, that the government has decided. Mm -hmm. uh, currently, there's a lot of this thing of public participation. But yeah. what type of public do you meet? If you don't prepare, and as I said at the beginning, I believe that any organization worth its salt must project its vision in the future and see what type of people or what type of leadership do they need. That is what we have come up with. Yes, at Independence, we had Kenya Institute of Administration. But we are saying, yes, it served its purpose at this critical point in time. We are not also ruling out or sidelining the current existing leadership training institutions. Mm -hmm. But you've realized that we have carefully structured this program to ensure that we are within the context of, 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 of our leadership development. There are already interns in the first cohort who have transitioned into the public service because our internship program does not guarantee you employment in the public service. Yes. So after that first exposure, we are targeting those who have barely joined in, those who have not yet gotten into the traditions and gotten uh, comfortable waiting to be promoted. No, we want therefore these people who have just joining in to be therefore in grain to be the thinkers of the future. Mm -hmm. So uh, what we're saying really is, is that in collaboration with EPL and ELF, mm -hmm. we have come together to co-develop a curriculum that will ensure that we take some of these issues into consideration. The public service, one of the things that public service teaches is really patience. It teaches that you know you, you, you join in at a lower level and you grow systematically. The, 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 the narrative that is really uh, coming up is, uh, especially among the youth, we need to be at the decision table. But when you are at the public service and the emerging leaders, what you are telling them, if you work hard, you will for sure be on that table. <laughs> if you perform, you will for sure be on that table. Eh? On on that but that is not the beginning. Okay. Okay. That's not the beginning. Being on that table requires a what? A process. Mm. We'll, come, we'll come to that, Dr. Yeah, Ari. We'll yeah, come to yeah. that just in yeah. a bit. Yeah. Let me pick your mind on just what he is saying because clearly it's a clear vision. There's exposure, participating on a global network. And really, from where you, you sit, when it comes to that aspect of networking, because it's part of what you're really hands on, how do you go about this in okay. the program? Thank you, that's a fantastic question. I think, uh, first of all, I just want to say that um, Dr. Sylvester is right, that we are offering a world-class uh, uh, training opportunity. Okay. We have partnered with Chandler, Chandler Institute of Governance in Singapore. And so essentially what we have is a curriculum that's been co-developed between those who understand the Kenyan context, those who understand the global context, even in the US and across Africa, such as ourselves, <coughs> emerging public leaders, Singapore, who are a model for governance for many, very, for very many countries, and the experience that ELF brings in training. So I was thinking about it. When we interviewed some of these candidates, some of these candidates are stationed in difficult places, such as Kakuma. So what, there's a candidate who's in Kakuma as a correctional officer. Now this individual will have the opportunity to engage with leaders such as President Ellen Johnson Sirleaf, leaders such as Ambassador Mutara, leaders such as Bitangi Demo, people who have uh, ex ex a lot of experience and who have a lot of insights to share. These individuals will focus on uh, becoming more citizen-centric. They'll understand not just you know, what uh, public engagement is, but also how to do it, the various mechanism, mechanisms for doing it. They'll also understand the distinction between public service leadership and leadership in general, because there are many trade-offs there. For example, making sure that there's enough equity as well as efficiency. And if there's anything that you know, one considers, um, a lot of the, the alumni in our network, and to your question on networking, mm -hmm. 
our, uh, our alumni in Liberia have gone on to become cabinet ministers. They've gone on to go to missions in the UN and lead them. In Ghana, it's a very similar case. Uh, in Ghana and Liberia, our fellows are the ones who helped um, spearhead the response to COVID-19 and very successfully. So in, from our context, we see this as an opportunity for our fellows in Kenya to, to network with people who are not better than them, but who are their peers in every single sense. Uh, if there's anything to what um, Dr. Sylvester said about youth coming to the table, uh, I think that Jim and I being on this seat is evidence of the fact that if you work hard enough and you seize these opportunities such as our fellowship, you'll find yourself at this decision-making table and be able to stretch out a hand for other young people to join. And that is not to say that Dr. Sylvester is not young. He's a very a young person. And certainly youthful yeah. at heart. Young, yeah. young at heart. He's young, young at heart, yeah. 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 <laughs> Let's talk a bit about that. I mean, he's really touched big on the networking bit yeah. because I tend to always think all the time, um, when, especially when it comes to youth, the aspect of mentorship which you touched on and networking is always a big issue. Someone said that your network is your net worth. Yes, he's talked about it, but also in the Kenyan perspective, how do you navigate this among this uh, youth that you get to the program? Um, as, as, as we've said, uh, you know, in Kenya, we define youth as 18 to 35. Mm -hmm. In many other jurisdictions, it is 15 to 24. Um, and so I think in Kenya, we have tried to accommodate the youthful at heart in our definition of youth. Um, and our networks, what we believed is, one is among the youth themselves, there's enough wealth of knowledge, there's enough wealth of experience that we tend to connect them. And so we do what is called movement building. But how do you connect like-minded young people um, in you know, the public sector, in a county, in whatever sector that you get into, how do you ensure that you're able to identify young people who are like-minded, who share the same vision of leadership and transformation, and ensure that they form a think tank among themselves, um, and they are able to then you know, influence one another. The second bit where we get the networking from is from those who've gone ahead of them, as we've said. Mm -hmm. And so for every young person that we bring in, one of the things we look at is, you know, what are you working on? So if someone is, is, is in communications, or is in, we try to ensure that we are connecting them with someone who's gone ahead of them in that particular field of communication, because we want them to grow. We want them, success doesn't happen overnight, as, 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 as we'll come to appreciate. It is a journey and it is a systematic process that goes ahead. And we have seen a lot of these mentors expose our young people to opportunities within their networks. We've seen them give them, not just jobs, because sometimes when you think of opportunities, we think about jobs, but there have been opportunities are saying, hey, there's an interview at KBC and they're looking for a young person who can speak on youth in politics. Are you interested in going? And opening that door for them and ensuring that that young person gets to get that opportunity. Hey, I know there's a workshop or there's a seminar happening somewhere and I think it would be important for you to be in that room and listen to that seminar. There's a training that's worth an X amount of money. Are you able to then you know, collect from your family or from your friends and attend that particular training? Um, there is a scholarship that is being offered. Please apply for this scholarship. And so exposing the young person to as many opportunities as possible for personal development and growth. Because when that happens, is this young person, at any given time, a young person has at least five people that they can influence. Because young people are the greatest influence of themselves. And so if you're exposing one young person to such great opportunities, you're essentially exposing at least five other young people to such opportunities mm -hmm. because they're able to influence one another. So that's how we create a network. We create a network by ensuring that we have, within any ecosystem, we have one young person that we can count on, train them, give them as many opportunities as possible, and then in turn, they are giving it back, and there's peer mentorship happening among themselves. Um, those of them who cannot access, for instance, you're only able to get 50, but as we've said, this 50, we are sure are going to influence at least, at the very least, another 150 young people within the public service. Mm -hmm. So there's a ripple effect to any kind of opportunity that you give to young people. Um, and as I said at the beginning, young people are capable if given opportunities and if exposed um, to opportunities at that age. Mm -hmm. Well let said. Me, let let me just, just hold that thought. Yeah. We want to take a very quick break. When we return, we're coming back with you okay, to chime you. into that as we continue this conversation. Time for that break. Stay with us. We come back to continue the conversation.
still on with youth leadership and governance as our conversation this morning and my guest is still on set helping us dissect that. Tari, before we went to break, you had something to say. Yeah, I just want to, to illustrate on the networking and the practical aspect of mm -hmm. it. Uh, we got the first cohort of interns in 2019. And after my first session with them, I told others that if you'd like maybe to get some of these opportunities, please, you can contact me. A young man contacted me, came to my office. He said he wanted to do a master's. We looked at the available opportunities. We worked with him. I did his recommendation. I contacted the university. The university wrote to me back. He got a full scholarship on mathematical modeling for engineering. Mm -hmm. One of the prestigious schools in the in, in Europe, he was admitted. Last December, he told me he has been admitted for a PhD. I did his recommendation. But one thing that happened also, he sent me the link for the intake, and I shared the link in another group. So really, networking is critical. Our main aim really is also to network this, this youth. I also, as a graduate of University of Newcastle, Australia, if I recommended you up to last year, you would get a $10,000 rebate on your fees. Mm -hmm. And a number of young people took it. So we talk about networking, we're talking about opportunities. These are not things that we're talking in the space. Mm -hmm. They are practical. Mm -hmm. And therefore networking this, yeah. this young can have a ripple effect, you see, as, 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 as Jim said. So one of our critical aims of the internship program is one, to, 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 to ingrain them into the public service to network and also give them industry experience. For the fellowship, we want to build them into future leaders. But networking is not out of the mix. Networking is also one of them. Mm -hmm. We want to expose them at the highest level of decision making. Mm -hmm. We want to expose them and make them know really how did the leaders of yesterday make it. Mm -hmm. So for me, that is a critical ingredient of our current leadership development program. Well said, well said. And I mean, let me just stick with you on this one because yes, you're talking about networking, mentorship, very important. But what is stopping young people from engaging in these leadership positions or even taking them all together without, without idolizing those that have gone before them? Because you can mentor me, but sometimes I may really not bring out my best because I just want to be like you who has mentored me. We, we've got mentorship and coaching. Okay. You see, most of the time, yes, if a youth says that they want to be like me, I've served for 31 years in government. Mm -hmm. But you see, shadowing my path is extremely difficult. Mm -hmm. I started my career in, in national treasury before completely shifting into the public sector policy arena. So you see, you, 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 you can't say that I want to start at Treasury, then go to Cabinet Office, then go to the, to the, to the Ministry of, uh, maybe Minister of Public Service, then end up at the Public Service Commission. It's not really about being like me. It is about the principles, learning how did I make it. You see, yes. I've had an opportunity to work both at, in the private and in the public sector. So really, and I, I understand the youth. When also at my youthful step, I thought I was extremely educated, having come back with a master's, and I thought government was not paying me much. So I went to the private sector. I went to Price Auto Scoopers. But within two years, I made a retreat and came back to the government. Mm -hmm. And really, I think that exposure is important. But if you do not tailor it and make it systematically a few can succeed through trial and error but we want to say why don't we make it systematic that they know from this stage they go to this stage rather than leaving them to trial and error maybe they are living today because they don't know what awaits them tomorrow maybe the people they have interacted with are people who have had a bad experience in the public service maybe the people who have made them leave did not really know what is the long term plan okay. if you expose the long term plan then we are saying that we can have a higher rate of retention because i know if i do one two three four then i will be there so that is for me, that is the path we are trying to chart with them. The public sector is so big, it has got very 
different people with very different inclination. They might not treat them the same way I will treat them. Yes. But if therefore they happen to land on, 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 on a person who does not treat them well and then they leave, then we'll be losing. So what we're saying, as part of this mentorship, drawing for them a clear path and coaching, then they might see the end term goal that the government prepares for them. Okay. That way, they can be, we can be able to retain them. Okay, well yeah. said. Do you think that civic, civic education is a, is a deterrent to most of these young leaders or the youth as a whole? Because you can talk about mentorship, the trainings, networking, being in the decision-making table, but is it a missing link? That's an interesting question as to whether civic uh, education is a missing link uh, for understanding these opportunities. I don't think so. Okay. And let me just make uh, a few controversial statements. Mm. We are in the information age, and uh, no, there's no better demographic to understand what is available on the internet than the young people. If anything, I challenge the young people, such as myself, to actually spur civic education themselves. I don't see why they would need to wait for those who are much older. It's an opportunity for them to come forward. And just to kind of uh, touch on something that uh, Dr. Sylvester has said, is that <clears throat> we are look, we're not looking to develop uh, scholars, we're looking to develop leaders. And leaders have to have an internal grit. They have to understand what it takes to actually lead in the public service or even outside of the public service. They have to, leadership is also idiosyncratic. You have your own personal journey towards leadership. You heard uh, Dr. Terry say that you know, he went through PwC and through many government positions mm. and through uh, University of Newcastle. Myself, I went to Cambridge University. I went to Oxford University. I then went to PwC and McKinsey. I then did a tour through government. I spent time in Kipra. I went to CMA. And now I'm supporting government. But those are personal decisions I have made to see where I can fit in. If one door doesn't open, you open another. You find another window to get into, into government or to support uh, government in some way. So I think whilst um, the civil society and, and civic engagement is very, very important, I also think that the youth have an opportunity to lead in that respect as well. Mm -hmm. I mean, we talk about emulation, we talk about the mentorship, which is, is very important because part of what I got from you is that you're really hands-on and big on mentorship. And again, this is one of those things that youths, just from a broader perspective, they tend to lack the aspect of mentorship. But coming to you, Jim, do you think that the youths, particularly in this country, have lost faith in their leaders? Um, so just, uh, just to piggyback a bit on, on, on the question around mentorship. The delicate balance of mentorship is always, you know, overcoming the attempt to create your mentee in your own image. Okay. Um, a lot of times a mentor wants to create a mentee in their own image. Mm -hmm. And so you want this young person to be like you. Um, you know, and that's, 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 you know, that's for God. God is the only one who creates us in his own image. The rest mm -hmm. of us, we can only try to um, show a path and show a direction that the young person needs to take. Um, on opportunities, uh, we have done a program with the Ministry of Youth where we'll be going to a lot of spaces in this country, especially in informal settlements and in rural villages, um, to hold town hall meetings with, with, with young people. And what we've done is any place that we go to, we bring help alongside us. We bring, um, you know, any financing opportunities are there within government, any loans that are being given. We bring as many government institutions and the non-governmental institutions as well to these places. And any time we're talking and you're saying, oh, by the way, if there's any young person here who has cleared Form 4 and you want to continue with your education, there's a help desk right outside this hall. Please go and register with them. They will give you a loan. When we've taken that practical approach, you've realized that whereas we assume that a lot of this information is readily available and people should know, the reality is a lot of young pe people do not know because they are buried in hopelessness. There's a lot of hopelessness in this country, um, and particularly among young people, because you grow up in an environment and sadly that environment shapes your mind and your attitude. That environment shapes who you become. And so if you grow up in an environment where everybody is hopeless and nobody uh, sees anything positive positive around them. Nobody sees any opportunities and people keep saying the government has forgotten about us. You know, your, your parts are already defined for you in that particular culture. And that is the reality of so many young people across this country. And so a few who live in Nairobi have the luxury of saying, you know, 
we know where these things are, but the reality on the ground is very different. And so we have to take the deliberate approach in some of these communities to actually go in and say, here are the opportunities, please take them up. And some of them have gone ahead and taken them up and support them on that journey because again, where they have grown up has defined who they are. Mm -hmm. But have young people given up on, on their leaders? To a large extent, a lot of young people have. To a large extent, because I've said, there's a lot of hopelessness. If you walk into so many communities, the realities that you have in your house and in your neighborhood, a lot of people do not have those, those, those things. And so a lot of young people feel and see, um, and it will go back. We do a lot of work in, in the civic engagement space, governance and civic engagement space. We see a lot of young people who do not want to register as voters, for instance. A lot of young people who do not want to show up. They have registered, but they do not show up on voting day because they do not see the sense in it. Mm -hmm. They have seen governments come and go. They have not seen any result, any benefit to them, at least in their opinion. Mm -hmm. They have seen their colleagues go to college and leave college and tarmac for five, six years without any jobs. They have seen people go to college and pull cards on the streets and so there is really nothing for them to look forward to and so there's a sense of hopelessness mm. in a lot of our communities and I think that's why when we keep saying that we are targeting 50 young people we are targeting a hundred young people the idea is how do we restore this hope among them how do we ensure that if we are able to influence this 50 they're able to go back to communities and influence the others mm -hmm. because that's the reality of many communities all right a majority of young people are hopeless i think i've counted the number of times james hopeless. has, has <laughs> mentioned that word in his response and he's also talked about even the facts that good number of young people do not even want to register as voters. On that IBC report, it showed that this was their biggest target, but that didn't happen. In fact, IBC came out to say that for those aspirants or those vying for different elective positions, if they're targeting the youth, then they should look for other alternatives. Is it a question of vote of no confidence towards the leaders or amongst the youth themselves? Because we keep saying that, anyway, change begins with you and I. So if I don't make a step, what exactly will happen to me as a young person? Oh, in government, we hold a lot of workshops. Mm -hmm. And the very first thing we do when we go for a workshop is expectations. Mm -hmm. One of the most critical things we've realized that we've not managed the expectations of the youth. Mm -hmm. From the word go, why do they go to a university? Mm -hmm. We've not managed their expectations. And we've not guided them well. Mm -hmm. uh, 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 and uh, w during the first cohort, I, 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 did, I did interviews for interns in Western Kenya, Viga Kakamega. At the end of that process, I was extremely saddened, but also very happy. Because I realized that I was at times interviewing first class aeronautical engineers who are telling me that maybe they have not been placed. But I was also pleasantly surprised that the very bright students have actually found something to engage themselves in. I've found a biomedical technologist. Who knows the trend of medical research? Who knows the current trends? But this guy, having done his first, at his at last attachment at Cambridge and was not absorbed, very quickly went back to Muhoroni and enrolled himself in a metal fabrication uh, course for six months. By the time he was coming for the internship interview, he told me, he showed me photos of the gates he had done and told me he was doing very well. He had two dairy cattle, he had a farm. And I asked him, man, with all these things, why do you still want to come for the internship? He told me, I am still interested in medical research. I am not going to leave my industry. And I found a number of those extremely entrepreneurial uh, failures. I found a lady from Busia who told me he got uh, watermelon from Bali and pineapples from Busia and then got a hand cut guy to sell them in some local market. Mm. I was extremely impressed. I got a lady in Vihiga who did education and told me she gets mutumba, mm. she gets mutumba, irons them, cleans them and then supplies them to the teachers 
and the local. But I also got a group of people who told me, you know, there is no work in government. Mm -hmm. I've just been applying. I've never been a, a call for an interview. You see, in this government, unless you know somebody, nothing can happen. I did not take that type. Those who were engaged, I took. What we are saying is managing expectations. Mm -hmm. And I think maybe through our schooling system, we've not managed the expectations well. We need to do something and tell them really, what are we especially doing in expanding education space? It is better to have, an, as a country, to have unemployed youth than to have illiterate youth. They are more useful to the economy. So for me, education expansion, yes, to an extent, we needed to have also thought about expanding our industry and absorbing them. But to a large extent, I think we need to manage expectations. Mm -hmm. Even those who we end up taking will tell you that, ask them, where would you like to be in five years' time? The common uh, feedback is, I would like to be in an influential policy position in government. Decision making. <laughs> Decision making in five years time. You see, so those are the, the most interesting. I would met one, I talked to the, to, the, to the youth and I want just to gauge them, where are they? A young man told me we, who had just entered university first year. So where do you see yourself in the next five years? He told me that he sees himself as a judge. I was wondering, within seven years, you have not even finished. But he's ambitious. <laughs> yeah, ambitious. But is it practical? <laughs> Those are the things. Are these ambitions pra practical? Okay. You have started first year law school. Mm -hmm. You have got about five years to go to law school, isn't it? And then you have got about one year to be admitted, two years to be admitted to the bar. Mm. It means that you are just starting. A judge must have practiced for a minimum of seven years, according to the current regulation, okay. which means that if you think you will be a judge within seven years, there seems to be either lack of information or something. Like that. So I think what, what I'm saying, mm -hmm. I don't, uh, yes, it's good to be ambitious, but it's also good to be realistic. Mm -hmm. And I think Doreen, really just mm -hmm. jumping onto the point that Dr. Sivas has made, mm -hmm. is that I think sometimes we have a challenge with perspectives. Mm -hmm. So uh, for young people, um, I think where the hopelessness comes in is when you look at leadership and opportunity as a zero sum, Mm. Uh, game. Mm. When it's zero sum, you say that it's either old people or young people. Mm. But really, there's been a shift from that. It's not about li a zero sum game. It's really about what's called intergenerational co leadership. Mm. So, how can I be at the same table as Dr. Sylvester, as we're doing right now? Mm -hmm. Not mm. how can I eliminate Dr. Sylvester from being at this table so that I can take his place? Mm -hmm. Because let's be realistic. If I challenge Dr. Sylvester in that way, he's likely to pull back. He's likely to, to close the door for me. Yeah. But if I say I simply want some room and to join you at the table and to work together, I think that's the perspective that changes. Now, another thing around perspective is that I know uh, individuals who have started as, as cleaners, who have gone on to work in nursing homes, who've then gone on to secure PhDs and go to some of the top schools, Harvard, uh, Yale, ETC. Mm -hmm. And why do they do this? Um, what I'm saying is that some of these individuals, despite their education, they took up opportunities to work in very menial jobs. And over, over, the, over time, they proved that they have the attributes that may not be technical, but may be professional. So punctuality, mm -hmm. presentation, delivery skills, communication skills. So all of those are means of opening up opportunities uh, to be at that table when the time comes. Okay. Speaking of old people and young people, just drink from what Levi has said, and let me come to you, Jim. If you can remember in 2018 when the president appointed the former vice president, that was Mudiawe to the position of uh, chair of the sports board fund. It caused an uproar amongst Kenyans. At that time, he was 91 years old and the question was if he can do this where does this leave the young people the president was very categorical he said that it's because young people who had been put in that position could not stop or curb the issue of corruption a bit of theft and so he thought the older folks were better placed so aside from ideas passion zeal what can young folks bring to the table when it comes to leadership that's a good question, um, and, it, and it, puts us, uh, it puts me on the spot on that. Yeah, as a young uh, person. As, as, a, as a young person. One of the things that we must appreciate, the conversation in the country has always looked like we're pitting, as, as, as Andrew was saying, mm -hmm. we're pitting young people against old people, old people against young people. And so constantly when the president makes an appointment, you want to look at what age 
what, what's the age of that person? Mm -hmm. One without looking at what's the experience level. Mm -hmm. Yeah, what is what is what because the level of experience they're bringing a value to that particular position that they've been appointed to. Mm -hmm. All right, and so then we also have to look at and we also cannot generalize because I've also had this thing of people saying we have given some young people opportunities and they have gone ahead and disappointed us. The counter is you've also given a lot of old people opportunities and they have really disappointed us. Mm -hmm. So the whole question of disappointment and corruption and embezzlement has nothing to do with age. It has nothing to do with whether you're old or young. It's just a values issue. If you're a corrupt individual, whether you're young or old, you're a corrupt individual. Um, and what, what then has happened is that over time, a lot of young people have then taken the opportunity to then pick that conversation, which a lot of the time it gets lost on us what really needs to happen. We need to create opportunities for young people where they are. We need to mm. create a position for young people where they are. And so we are getting lost in this national conversation our point of PSS and CSS, where truth be told, we, if, even if we were to have young people, we would only have 20 young people appointed in a country where we have about over 20 million young people who are, who are young. So the truth is the conversation needs to be on creating opportunities of the, where young people are, at the lower level where they are, so that, as you said, they get the opportunity to get the industry experience and to grow over time. Mm. Because let it not be lost on us. The dignity that comes with economic empowerment, mm. that's, it's a dignifying thing to have a source of livelihood. It is a dignifying thing. It improves even the quality of your engagement with people. It improves the quality of your engagement um, in conversations. It improves even the quality of decision making at the ballot. If, you're, if you have a source of livelihood. Mm -hmm. If you do not, then it means you're susceptible to bribery, you're susceptible to, to, to a 50 bob in exchange of your vote. Mm -hmm. But if you have a source of livelihood, then you can overlook that and you can stop talking about issues and say, in our community, mm -hmm. we actually need water. Okay. That's what we need and that's why we're going okay. to vote for you. Okay. So what young people bring to the table for me is at, they bring their youthfulness okay. yeah. and vibrance. <laughs> uh, I just want to emphasize on that. Yes. We've, it's taken us two years to contextualize this program to the Kenyan context. Jim, Andrew, came with the idea of that youthfulness, but we sat and discussed. Mm -hmm. At the Public Service Commission, I joined the Public Service Commission in 2016. My first responsibility was to set up the research unit, okay. research and police analysis unit. Mm -hmm. The position of a director is only one, mm -hmm. but in the research and police analysis unit, there are four positions for entry researchers. Mm -hmm. From police and analysis unit, I went to set up the performance and service delivery transformation, All right. All right. a department of 29. Mm -hmm. The position of a director is only one, but there are 14 entry positions. Okay, okay. <laughs> you see, so what we're saying really, there is value in working together. Mm -hmm. So the, the, the issue is not that Sylvester exits, I want to become a director, but is there value? In the creation. So, okay. what would you rather trade on? 14 positions or one position? Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> That's where mentorship also comes in. Yeah. Well, Sarah, this is a good yeah. place to end yeah. this conversation. Obviously, I've been speaking to Dr. Sylvester Obongo. He is the Director, Performance and, and Service Delivery, Deli Delivery Transformation at the Public Service Commission. Right next to him is Jim India, the Program Manager at Emerging Leaders Foundation Africa, as well as Andrew Lev who is the Global Senior Manager at Emerging Public Leaders USA. And we've been having the conversation surrounding youth, leadership, and governance. The space, uh, the space is available and what you can do as a young person to get into these spaces. This is where we bring the conversation to a close, but Good Morning Kenya continues after this break. Stay with us.